Welcome to the live Bible study hosted by Andrew Womack Ministries and Karis Bible College. Tonight, you'll learn truths from the Word with believers around the globe. Submit any questions you have in the comments and share this broadcast tonight with your friends. Hello and welcome to our Tuesday night live Bible study. I'm here with Carrie Pickett and she's a regular here and uh, she's been a super blessing. Amen. Her and her husband are vice presidents of our Karis Bible College and also all of our what, global offices worldwide. So she's got a lot of responsibility and we've just been talking before the thing started about how she's dealing with all these problems. I praise Ooh. God for her. I'm not dealing with them. <laughs> So anyway, Carrie Amen. is a blessing, and uh, we are going to be teaching and studying tonight about emotions. I started this last week, so I'll go back and give a little context of what we said. But first, we want to let you know how you can be a part of this. Amen. And Carrie, this is growing. I'm getting people now all of the time telling me that this has become a regular deal, and yeah. we have people from... I don't even know, probably 20 yeah. countries. Yeah, we always have, like tonight, Nigeria and South Africa, Philippines. We always have Hong Kong. There's always so many nations and states that join us. And so thank you guys so much for, for being faithful. They talk about being a Tuesday night family and they eat dinner over, eat, watching it together. And, and so we just appreciate that. What makes this so awesome is that it's interactive. And I think this is what's unique is they get to ask questions. So whatever forum that you're watching on right now, uh, when Andrew's talking tonight, you can just go to that and add your question. We're going to get it. We're going to get through as many as we possibly can. Try to keep them on topic because we're able to get through more that way. But we love hearing your question and answer. And Andrew giving the answers, um, but also Aaron gives answers too. <laughs> He's a powerful minister. Thank you. So, and also we have powerful ministers in our prayer line. Prayer line. Uh, these are students. These are graduates. These are just filled with the word people. So you can call them for if you have prayer requests, if you're needing agreement on something, if there's a question that we just did not get to and you need an answer because you're going through a situation, you say, I need someone to agree with me, then please call our helpline 719-635-1111 and they're going to be able to pray with you. And also, Andrew's always mentioning some of the plethora of material that has been, that we Minister? Plethora. Plethora. I'm impressed. Thank you. Thank you. I read my dictionary before I came tonight. Uh, That's like I used the word obstreperous tonight with one of our employees, and she looked it up and said, How dare you say that? <laughs> I don't even know what Every that once means. in a while we come up with these good words. <laughs> obstreperous. Uh, yeah, amen. So, uh, what were we talking about? <laughs> Well, the yes, plethora the of plethora materials. of material. If you want to get some of Andrew's material, then you can also call our, our helpline, and they have everything that Andrew has said, and you can go on and, you know, the different books and the CDs, free material. It's going to be a blessing. Also, this is a viewer-supported uh, uh, broadcast. It's going to everyone in the world, and so please, you get to, by supporting it, not only are you getting to be ministered to, but really ministering to lots and lots of nations and different people. So if you'd like to be a part of helping us minister to other people, go ahead and please give. You can do that when you call the helpline, and that would be tremendous. Also, we give a free uh, uh, product away every time. And if you would like a free product, um, you have the opportunity to win it by registering for the Bible study notes. So also one of the things besides the live interaction, calling the helpline, you also can get notes. And so whatever Andrew's ministering on, you're going to get notes. They're going to send it out to you. And if you haven't done that, go to awmi.net slash Bible study, and they're going to get you all those notes. And if you register, then you can enter to win how to deal with temptation. That is really a good teaching. I hadn't taught on this in years, and I was reading the titles back here, and I, it reminded me, and I thought, you know what? I need to teach on this. Basically, it's like, it's, man, it's I need to yield. listen to this. <laughs> I need this. No. <laughs> really good. So if you would like to, to, to get that, if you say, hey, you know, I need that, whether I'm going to win it or not, again, call the prayer line. Uh, last uh, week, we gave Effortless Change Away. That was our winner uh, for Christopher Bennett. So Christopher, congratulations. We're going to get that out to you. And so these are just some of the many things that we're trying to do, just to minister, to bless you, uh, to pray with you. But also we have so many things going here live at Karis Bible College. And so I'm so glad you joined us through internet and all the digital age, but we would love, love to have you come meet us here, meet you in person, pray for you in person, our prayer ministers. But we have a couple things going on here soon. We have the In God We Trust rally. That's on September 14th. It's going to be powerful. I had a bunch of meetings on that today. It's really good. Yeah. So we have just, just talking about the aspect of just how to 
politics and us as believers and really how to pray, how to stand, how to communicate during such a critical time. Also, the minister's conference is going to be uh, September 30th. Wow, that's coming that's up correct. soon. Yep. Um, September 30th through October 4th. And so that's going to be awesome. Last year was phenomenal. It has so many amazing ministers. So if you're in full-time ministry or serving in full-time ministry, we would love to have you. Um, that's going to be awesome. And then also we have the Women's Arise. It's coming um, in November, November 7th, 8th. And then on the 9th, we're having our world premiere of Esther, one of our new musical productions mm -hmm. that are by Kara. So these are just some of the amazing things. If you're interested in, go to awmi.net slash events. We'd and love Carrie to have you. Carrie is going to be teaching at the minister's yes. conference and at the Women Arise conference. And I'm going to be an Esther. How oh, are you? <laughs> yeah, I don't know what I'm going to do. Hopefully, if if I sing or dance, it would be should, worth coming yeah, it would be. to see. <laughs> that would be a red letter day. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> All right, so we want to talk about emotions, but let me give a little context to this that last Tuesday, when we started talking about this, just the week before that, we had seen a baby raised from the dead. Mm -hmm. We had seen a man bring his wife up who was had a brain disease. She mm -hmm. couldn't talk. She couldn't walk. She couldn't. She looked like she was nearly dead. And she got started talking. Got up and walked down yeah. the steps. That was and awesome. I don't know if you heard, but last night I was uh, giving a report on our Truth and Liberty broadcast. Which, if you aren't aware of this. On Monday nights, we always have a live broadcast also, and it's more political and about current events type thing. And uh, Richard Harris is our chief counsel for Truth and Liberty, and he was giving a testimony that just last week they had a baby raised from the dead in his church. Mm -hmm. They had a man that had renal failure and passed out in uh, Walmart, and they said that he was very close to death, and he just supernaturally raised up. And they had a man that prayed for his mother who was a Buddhist and she had knee problems and stuff and he prayed for her and uh, he didn't pray over the phone. He just says, I'm going to pray for you. And her knees were completely healed. She called him three days later and she threw away all of her Buddhist stuff and said, Buddha never did any of this for me. I'm becoming a Christian. That's so anyway, awesome. you see all of these great things happen. And I mean, people get just on an emotional high and then they don't know what to do after that wears off. And it's always going to wear off. God does not want you relating to him only by emotions. Yeah. He wants you to walk by faith. Hebrews eleven six. without faith, it's impossible to please him. Does this mean that God doesn't want you to have emotions? No, emotions are great. And when you have them, you need to enjoy them, but you don't need to become addicted to emotions. And I would say that the vast majority of Christians are they are in a position where they use the Word of God to try and reach some emotional high or some emotional estate. And if they were to reach that place to where they could just feel the presence of God, they'd forsake the Word of God because they aren't really committed to the truth of the Word of God. What yeah. they're doing is trying to get God to touch them, to have a vision, a dream, a goosebump. And I'm telling you, that is not mature Christianity. Mm -hmm. So again, I am not against emotions. I have emotions, believe it or not. Some people don't think I do because I don't indulge any emotion that's negative. Uh, like I was saying, you know, uh, last time, I saw the first time I saw a man raised from the dead, I just thought I was going to move to the next realm and that I'd never have another problem. And that night, my ministry at church was not good. Mm -hmm. I didn't do well because I was ministering out of my emotions and out of my excitement yeah. instead of out of my heart and faith. And I went to bed actually discouraged mm -hmm. because, God, I thought it was going to be better than this. And, <clears throat> and so I've just learned that, yes, when emotions come, I enjoy them, but I don't seek emotions. And if they are negative emotions, if there's anything contrary to what the Bible says, Galatians 5, 22, the fruit of the Spirit's love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. If it's contrary to that, I don't indulge it. I will not give place to them. I will not have them. Yeah. And I know that there's people watching this and saying, you can't live that way. Well, don't wake me up. This is how <laughs> I'm living. So anyway, that's what we've already talked about. Let me use these verses in James chapter 1 and in verse 12, again, I wish I had, let me just go to verse 13 
And I wish I had time to put this in his context because it's even more powerful if you understood the context of it. But in verse 13, it says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Verse 14, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Now, in the King James, it uses the word lust, and today the word lust is used nearly exclusively by people to refer to an illicit sexual desire. Mm -hmm. But in the Bible, it's not used that way. Matter of fact, Galatians 5, 16 says the Spirit, talking about the Holy Spirit, lust against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit. So that is not talking about some illicit sexual desire. This is talking about just a strong emotion is what the word lust is. And today we use it nearly exclusively to refer to illicit lust or desire, but it's just meaning strong desire. And if you look this up in like the NIV, it actually says that, uh, Every man is drawn away of his own desire. And then when desire has conceived, it brings forth sin. So here's the point I'm trying to make from these verses is that instead of emotions being like the caboose on a train that just, you know, follows like if somebody does something bad to you, well, I'm hurt. I can't help but be hurt. Mm -hmm. No, your emotions aren't the caboose. They are the engine. Your emotions actually drive things. Your emotions, as it says right here, that you conceive sin in your emotions or in your lust or desires, depending on which translation you look at. So here's a comparison. In the same way as children don't come by the stork mm -hmm. and you don't get pregnant by drinking the water after somebody else or just praying for a child, you have to conceive a child. This says that lust or emotions when they conceive bring forth sin. Yeah. And see, most people think, well, no, I don't want to be depressed, but I don't have any control over it. It's a chemical imbalance. I had something happen to me and they have just accepted the yeah. fact that you cannot control emotions. Mm -hmm. And just for time's sake, I'm going to quote some of these things. I've got so much teaching on this. I've got an entire series entitled Harnessing Your Emotions that goes into a lot of detail on this. And you could call our number 719-635-1111 and any of our prayer ministers can send that out to you. And, or you can go to our website and get it and listen to these teachings free. But anyway, in this teaching, let me just mention some of the scriptures like John chapter 14, verse one, Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. And you know, if you had to diagram that sentence, like with a subject and a verb, the way we did when we were in school, there isn't a stated subject to that sentence. It just says, let not. That's a verb, let not. So if you had to diagram it, you would have to put you, let not, as the understood subject to that. My point is, Jesus told you not to let your emotions Amen. get out of control. Now, if you couldn't control your emotions, then Jesus would have been completely unjustified in asking us or commanding us to do something that you can't do. Mm -hmm. So he started his, his uh, teaching to his disciples. This was the night before his crucifixion. And he said, let not your heart be troubled. See, some people would say, well, yes, <laughs> if it was something that, you know, was just minor, well then, yes, I would grab hold of my emotions. But if you're going through a divorce, Something's wrong with you if you aren't just, you know, destroyed and mm -hmm. bothered by this. If the doctor tells you you're going to die, you, something's wrong with you. You're in denial mm -hmm. if you don't indulge these emotions. Again, Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled the night before his crucifixion. And his disciples were going to see him for, you know, betrayed, beaten, condemned to death, crucified the next day and I guarantee you with the attitude that the average Christian has today, they would say that's wrong. Mm. You're wrong to tell a person not to grieve. You should be grieving if you saw Jesus condemned mm. and stuff. But Jesus said, don't let your heart be troubled. He goes on to say in John chapter 14, I believe it's around verse 27. He says, if you loved me, you would yeah. rejoice 
because I said I'm going to my Father. But now, because I've said these things, sorrow has filled your heart. You know what he's saying? The reason that you are grieving is because you're only thinking about yourself Mm -hmm. and you're thinking about, I gave up everything to follow you. I was counting on you being the Messiah. I've lost all of this and now what am I going to do? Yeah. If they would have been thinking about Jesus, you know, Jesus was just criticized, persecuted everywhere he went. He was maligned. Mm -hmm. And he had such a love for his father that he would stay up all night long talking to him. And if they were thinking more about him than they were thinking about Mm -hmm. themselves, at the very least, even if they didn't understand the resurrection, they would have said, well, at least he's with his father. If anybody was ever going to be accepted with the father, it would have been Jesus. And if they were thinking about him, it's what Jesus said, you would have rejoiced. The reason that they were sorrowful was because it was all Mm self-serving, thinking about self in the worst possible situation, worst scenario. They weren't thinking about him coming back to life. So he started his speech to his disciples that night, let not your heart be troubled. He ended it in John chapter 16, verse 33, by saying, in the world, you shall have tribulation. And I always think, yeah, within the next 30 minutes <laughs> when I'm arrested and taken out and beaten and stuff. He says, in the world, you shall have tribulation, yeah. but be of good cheer for I have overcome the world. So he started by saying, let not your heart be troubled. He said, if you loved me, you would rejoice. And then you are going to be persecuted in just the next few minutes, but let not your heart be troubled. You know, go ahead and rejoice in me. So all of these commands, and there are many, many more, show that you can control your emotions. And yet I know that the average person watching this program tonight is sitting here saying, and and you're listening to me and you're saying, but look what this person did. And so you have exceptions, Mm -hmm. which God didn't give. You know, forgive Jesus. He just wasn't aware of all of the problems that we would go through and all of the hardship that you had. And so he just didn't understand your situation. Not. I guarantee you, when he told you not not to let your heart be troubled, that's important. And let me just use this personal example that when my son died, my oldest son called and said, Peter is dead. And I guarantee you, I had shock hit me. I started to have grief sorrow, thinking about what's this going to be like? God, this isn't fair. Uh, You know, I had any emotion, any thought than any other person would have, but I knew these truths that I'm telling you. And I knew that sin, and not only sin, but you could say unbelief, it's conceived in your emotions. And I knew that if I let my emotions go, and if I indulge the hurt and the grief and the confusion, that there was no hope. And so the first thing I did, I started speaking my faith and I commanded my emotions to get in line and they didn't just do it immediately. And so I, I mean, for, uh, I don't know, for 10 minutes, 15 minutes or something like that, I was fighting these emotions and stuff. And finally on the way into town, I just started praising God at the top of my lungs and saying, Father, I worship you. You did not kill my son. And I started doing the exact opposite of what I felt like doing. Mm -hmm. I was resisting this. And the Bible says, James 4, 7, submit yourselves therefore unto God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And I'm telling you, negative emotions are from the devil. It says this is where you conceive sin. Let me use this analogy. This will probably shock some of you, but if you accept what I'm saying, it will help you too. That every time you indulge a negative emotion, discouragement, fear, anger, worry, care, all of these things, you are having intercourse with the devil. Mm -hmm. You are conceiving something that you do not want to give birth to. And the average Christian feels no conviction at all. They just think, well, but this happened to me. Carrie did this to me, and so I'm justified in feeling this way. You are just having intercourse with the devil. Mm -hmm. He is planting a seed in you, and you are going to have to have an abortion to keep from acting this thing out. Wow. Most Christians would say, oh, I'd never, I'm not into abortion. But yet in the spiritual realm, we just don't feel any conviction about having this relationship with negative emotions. We indulge them. And then when it conceives and starts bringing forth all of these negative things, oh God, help me not to do this. It's a lot easier just not to conceive it. Amen. 
You don't okay. use abortion as a way to stop the birth of anything in the natural or in the spiritual. It's easier not to conceive it. And I'm telling you, your emotions are where you are conceiving things. Mm -hmm. y your emotions are a powerful force. And there's people that know doctrine. They know what the Word says, but they don't embrace it. They aren't passionate about it, and therefore it doesn't have the power. You, you, once you start letting your emotions embrace a negative situation, and whether it's hurt, whether it's anger, whether it's unforgiveness, bitterness, whatever, anytime you let any of these negative emotions go, you have embraced this and you have con just conceived something. And I guarantee you, you do not want that. You got anything to say about that? I know you do. That's, <laughs> honestly, at that very moment you asked me, I was trying not to sneeze. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, so you don't have anything to say about it. <laughs> no. I was giving her an opportunity because <laughs> she's always got something to say. No, you know, I was actually, this is one of the things I was talking to my daughter about the other day, just as far as emotion and just that whole dynamic of you. And this is where authority and understanding your authority in Christ, that if you're feeling something, man, speak to those emotions. That's the thing about them. You having authority over and say, listen, I rebuke these emotions. Not that emotions can't be beautiful and godly and used as a, as a testimony, but I will not let them be the guide in my life. And so we just, Ellie, and I was telling her the other day, I said, you, you choose, and now you can tell your emotions. And that's a big thing because people, like you said, but whatever, whenever, however, I have no control. God has given you and granted you the authority so that your emotions, so you're not this emotional white hot mess that the enemy can just waste decades, literally decades of your life by emotion. People will often take what I'm saying and saying, so you're saying you just don't have any emotions. No, that's not what uh -uh. I'm saying. I'm a very emotional person. Most people don't really realize this, but Jamie and I watch, I'm not going to tell you what we were watching, but it was just a, it's a chick flick type thing. It's one of these romantic type things. Oh. And I get teary-eyed. I have emotions as long as they are godly emotions. When I see two people that, you know, were at, at odds with each other and they reconcile, it touches me. But that's a good emotion and that's something that I like. Mm -hmm. And at these meetings, when I saw that little baby raised from the dead, man, it's all I could do from, yeah. keep from just crying in front of people. Mm -hmm. I have emotions yeah. and I indulge them if there's something that I think is a godly emotion. Yeah. But I won't indulge in ungodly emotion. And so many people let the situation, this is where the enemy just loves emotions because then anything in the day can totally derail you. Somebody cuts you off, sure. you get upset, and then you're upset the rest of the day and it compounds and it builds versus something happening and realizing, you know what? I have authority, I take ownership of, of, of you know, what the Word of God says, declare it over and turn the situations of your day. I remember decades ago having a flat tire and I was going someplace, I needed to be there and you start to get just upset like your anger and I just sat down and thought, where is this gonna lead? This is not good, and flat tire's not going to take away my joy in the Lord, and so I reject those emotions, and I yeah. start praising God instead. Yeah. I remember going to a high school reunion. I think it was my 20-year high school reunion, and I, we just had the, the 50th year wow. high school reunion, so it, it, this was a long time ago. But anyway, Jamie wasn't with me, and I was talking to different people that I knew, and there was this one girl we never dated. We weren't boyfriend and girlfriend. But we, I guess, flirted in high school. So anyway, it was, you know, it was more than just I knew about her. It was a girl that I kind of liked. And anyway, <laughs> we got to talking and I went, when I went to my hotel room, I thought, what would have married, what would have happened if I'd have married her instead of Jamie? And did you know within 10 or 15 seconds, I got to thinking, what good can come out of this? This is not going to lead me any place positive. And I said, I am not going to think this. I am not going to indulge any emotions. And I had to start praying in tongues and I just cast those thoughts aside. Yep. And I know some people think, well, how dare you even have thoughts like that? All of us have these random thoughts come to us. You know, Kenneth Hagin said, you can't keep a bird from flying over your head, but you can keep it from landing in your hair and making Amen. a nest. <laughs> There's just going to be sometimes you have random thoughts, random feelings. Mm -hmm. If a person comes up and insults you, and I've had people spit in my face, 
I've had people cuss me out. I've been kidnapped. I've been abducted. I've been threatened to be killed. I've had a lot of things happen, and I guarantee you I have the same emotions that anybody would have yeah. if those things happened, but I just refuse to let them happen. Amen. I actually got run out of the town. You might have known about this. Uh, you were in Kit Carson. You were a little bit away, but, but anyway, I'm not going to go into the details, but I actually got run out of town on mm -hmm. a rail. And all of my Bible studies, six Bible studies, wow. interpreted something that happened. And if I would have told them what the real truth was, all of them would have been on my side. But to do that, I would have had to have Uncovered. hurt somebody mm -hmm. and uncovered something. And I just decided, yeah. well, I'll take the blame instead yeah. of exposing them. And because of it, we left. And I guarantee you, I started to feel self-pity. I started to feel, you know, like having a pity party and on and on. And I just knew that. I, there's no benefit to that. And so yeah. I just sucked it up yep. and didn't do it. Yep. And there's a lot of people that will not do that. They feel somehow or another that you'll feel better if you just let it all out. <laughs> no. It's not true. Because usually there's always regret. I'll, I'll tell you this, as a mom, if I get frustrated with my children, there's always regret afterwards. Mm -hmm. And if, if you, it just, it's just not worth it because the enemy tells you it's fine to feel this way. And then the moment you just kind of unleash, then you get condemned. I'm like, man, you're so emotional. And you're so <laughs> Here's a verse right here in this exact same chapter where we were that speaks directly to this. In verse 20, of James chapter one, it says, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Sometimes you think oh, I'd be better if I just vented, if I let this out, if I do this, the wrath of man yeah. does never yeah. accomplishes the right, uh, righteousness of God. You being depressed and discouraged and giving in to yeah. these feelings and venting and stuff, you, we've been told by psychology, I would say even the vast majority of Christians will sit there and pat you on the back and say, you need to just feel this. Go ahead and let it out and stuff. Yeah. That is not what the Word of God teaches. Yeah. You getting in the flesh is not going to accomplish a good thing. And mm -hmm. I guarantee you, in your spirit, Galatians 5, 22 and 23 says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. If you have any emotions contrary to that, it is not going to accomplish good. Mm -hmm. And you need to sit there and say, I'm not going to give in to these things. Yep. Amen. And I suspect that the majority of people watching this tonight have already given in to them. And you're in the process of giving birth to a lot of problems that these emotions have conceived. And so what do you do? Well, you start off by just saying, God, I'm sorry. Yeah. You repent of this. You let the love of God. Don't be condemned by what I'm saying, but don't be complacent and don't be ignorant of the devices of the devil. We've exposed a major deal yeah. tonight, and I guarantee you most Christians are indulging emotions that they should never do. So if you have done that, first of all, repent. Yeah. And just tell God that you're sorry. And then ask God for wisdom. How do I get out of this? Yeah. How do I undo the mess that I've made? And with many of you that have lived for decades indulging your emotions, uh, there's two things that could happen. If you have gone so far that you are demon possessed and Satan will come in and possess you and dominate you because you have given in to emotions. If you're demon possessed, you can be delivered and you will see some immediate results. But if it's just your flesh and if you've indulged it and you aren't totally demon possessed, that in a sense is actually harder because it's just a renewing of your mind and it's going to be a process and so one of the things I would do is I'd call our helpline yeah. and I'd ask people to pray with you and God may give you a specific word of exactly how to deal with it. At the very least, you could get my teaching on harnessing your emotions that will go into all the explanation and tell you what the antidote to all of this is. And it would be a real good resource for you. Amen. We have some really good questions as far, and I, again, like you said last time, it, it triggered a lot of questions, but here's, here's one. Um, Laura Ann on chat, she asks, she says, I have tried for a long time to rid myself of a spirit of fear and anxiety after, after abuse and rape. I was diagnosed with PTSD. What am I doing wrong? It keeps me from living my life, and I know it's not of God. I want to be free. 
And that was who? Laura Ann. So Laura Ann, if I could talk to you personally, I could probably give you specifics, you know, find out exactly where you are and stuff. But as a general rule, it says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, that perfect love cast out fear. Amen. And so if you're dealing with fear and hurt and all of these things that you're talking about, what you really need is a revelation of God's love. And I'm sure, Lorraine, that you have, you have a revelation to a degree or you wouldn't be watching this, you wouldn't be seeking the Lord. So I'm not saying that you don't understand God's love at all, but you need a deeper, greater revelation. Yeah. And I have actually talked to people Matter of fact, uh, Carly Teradez, I didn't know this. I don't know if you knew, but Carly Teradez was sexually abused by, I think, a grandfather mm. all through her childhood, which I never knew that until just last week or two that we were talking. But when she got born again, she fell so in love with the Lord that God's love was just like a tsunami mm. that overcame all of the sexual abuse awesome. that she had ever had. And, and Lorianne, that's what you need. I know you understand that God loves you to a Amen. degree, but there is, God's love is so much greater than what's happened to you that if you had a true revelation of it, it would, it's, it's just like, you know, the scripture says that yeah. when we go to heaven, that the former things will never even come to mind. Yeah. Some people think about the Holocaust, people that have been raped and all of these terrible things that happen and they think, how, how can I ever enjoy heaven? Because heaven is going to be so awesome when you see the great love of God mm -hmm. and what He's done that it'll, it says in Romans chapter 8 that the sufferings of this present world are not even worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us, yeah. not to us, but in us. Yeah. So, Lorianne, God loves you so much Amen. that if you really got a revelation of God's love, it would totally set you free from the hurt, the fear, Amen. and all of these kind of things. And I know that that sounds simple, and it is that simple. It's not necessarily easy. Yeah. And I can also say this, Lorianne, if those things are still impacting you years later, decades later, it's because you rehearse it in your mind. You're focused on it. And if you were to focus on what God is saying about you and get to where that is your focus, whatever you focus your attention on gets magnified and becomes bigger in your life. Yeah. And so you're going to have to intentionally resist focusing on these things, rehearsing it in your mind, and instead you have to focus on God and you need a revelation. You don't just need somebody to pray for you and ask God to show you His love. You need a revelation that comes from God and God wants to give it to you more Amen. than you want it. And so it begins with you just being honest and telling God, I'm sorry, I'm indulging these emotions. I don't even understand why I'm doing it, but I know that the antidote is your love. And if you will pray and become sincere with Him, He, he will overcome it. Amen. I really believe that. Amen. That's awesome. You got anything to say on that? Uh, I, I agree 100%. Okay. Absolutely. It's I'm trying to encourage you to participate. <laughs> you're so, you aren't so, just a hostess. You're a co-teacher. <laughs> Thank you. So AJ on Facebook said this, how do we know the difference between emotions and God's voice? How do we know which is which? Well, emotions, well, I don't know how to describe that other than by experience. Mm -hmm. You know, I have been listening to God for 51 years and there's been some times that I thought it was God Mm -hmm. and it was nothing but emotion. Mm. But when I crashed and burned because it wasn't God, I was able to say, oh, Oop, that was emotion. <laughs> that was emotion. <laughs> and so I think some of this you learn by trial and error. Now, of course, there's things in the Word of God that give you guidelines. Like I've got a teaching yeah. entitled How to Find, Follow, and Fulfill God's Will. And I teach from Psalms 37, 4, Colossians 3, 15, and many different scriptures that give you parameters and guidelines. But there's still a lot of subjective things in there. And, and so some of it is just you have to step out. And don't be afraid of making a mistake. It's like a little kid riding a bike. And if you are just, you know, so afraid that you're going to fall and it won't work, you'll you never learn to ride a bike. You just won't even get on it. <laughs> because you're afraid that it won't work. I, I bet you I fell when I was learning how to ride a bike. You probably did. Most people do. Most people don't do it perfectly. I fall when I'm an adult and ride a bike. <laughs> <laughs> and so don't be afraid to make a mistake. God's not going to fall off His throne 
Amen. The main thing is if your heart is pure, if your heart is right, and if you say, God, I'm new in this, I'm not totally sure, is this you or is it emotion? And if you would be open to it instead of saying, God, I know this is you, and so you're going to try and force God to do what you are so passionate mm -hmm. about, if you would just be honest enough to yeah. say, God, I'm young, I'm learning, show me, help me to learn your voice. And if your heart is pure, did you know God will bless you even if you made a total wrong mistake? Oh, yeah. Because he sees your heart, and in your heart, you were really trying to believe him. You were teachable, humble, humble. You're humble. just try, humble, <laughs> trying. You're just stepping out in what you think is obedience, and just yes. say, Lord, I'm going to step out, and if it's not you, close the door. Hallelujah. It's like that little kid riding a bike, and the parent, when they fall, you don't say, You idiot, if you'd done what I told <laughs> you, this wouldn't have happened. God's yeah. not like that. God will get up and say, Hey, you tried and you've learned something. You know what? You'll do it better next time. That's right. And so don't be afraid to step out, but at the same time, don't be so arrogant or self-confident that you can't make a mistake. Right. I'm still 51 years into walking with the Lord. There's many things that I'll get up and say, God, I believe that you're heading me this direction. And I'll just start moving in that direction slowly until I get absolutely convinced. Yeah. And if... I'm wrong. Uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 15 is a verse that I use a lot. Mm -hmm. And the context of it is in verse 13, it says, you know, forgetting the things that are behind, I press on towards the mark. But in verse 15, it says, and let as many of us as be perfect be thus minded. And if in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. This is a promise that if you are putting first the kingdom of God, this one thing you do and you're forgetting everything else and your focus is on God, if, if your heart is pure, God will reveal to you yeah, amen. when you're otherwise minded. Because you're sensitive. Yeah. yeah. My husband always says, you know, God can't steer a parked car. He says, just start moving and then God directs. And you, because mm -hmm. you're obedient and you're humble, you're teachable. So you're saying, Lord, if I've messed up, show me. Lord, if I need counsel, hey, if I've made a mistake, I'll apologize. But Lord, I'm after you. People are more action oriented than God is. God looks on the heart. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. Right. And if your heart is pure, God is going to keep you from doing terrible things. Yeah. You could make some mistakes and God may even let you learn by some of your mistakes. I remember. This guy can turn it even around. That's right. <laughs> He's so good. I remember my kids, you know, saying, I can do this. And I said, look, you aren't old. You don't understand. And they just wouldn't take no for an answer. They knew they could do anything. So I said, all right, go ahead. Mm -hmm. And I let them make mm -hmm. a mess because I knew it wasn't going to hurt them. It was a learning experience. Yeah. And so there are times that God will let you learn mm -hmm. through some of the mistakes that you make, but he's not going to let you go out and do something that's going to hurt you or hurt other people if your heart is pure. Yeah. It's a matter mm -hmm. of the heart. That's good. So uh, Maria says this on chat. She said, if you get angry and allow anger to rise up, say yelling at my child or spouse in anger, if that conceives a negative seed, how do I stop it from coming to fruition? Basically, when I miss it and I recognize I've missed it, how do I ensure I counteract the negative seed that was? That's what 1 John 1, 9 is all about. Most people use this in an incorrect way. That verse says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most people think that that is because every time you sin, it's a transgression against God and God won't fellowship with you, bless you. Even some Pentecostals will believe that you lose your salvation every time you sin. Mm -hmm. That's not what that's talking about no. because it says in Hebrews chapter 9 and chapter 10 that you've already been forgiven of all sin, past, present, and even sins you hadn't committed yet. So what's 1 John 1, 9 talking about? It's talking about when you get into the flesh, if you lose your temper, if you do all of these things that this mm -hmm. person is talking about, you have yielded yourself to the devil. Romans chapter 6, verse 16 says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves, servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Mm -hmm. So when you get into sin or into depression or into any of these things and you've conceived something, uh, you have yielded yourself to the devil. And he basically has a legal right mm -hmm. to plant that seed and bring something to birth. Yeah. So how do you deal with this? 
That's what 1 John 1, 9 is for. You say, Father, I know that you've forgiven Amen. me. My spirit is sanctified and perfected forever. I'm sealed. This didn't affect my relationship with you. You still love me even though I've acted foolishly. That's right. But I gave place to the devil and now I confess this as sin. I repent of it. And the moment you do that forgiveness that's already in your spirit, it now flows out. You have quit yielding yourself to the devil. That's good. That's you good. have humbled yourself, admitted I'm wrong. And now this forgiveness that's in your spirit flows through your soul and cleanses your soul of the depression, the discouragement, condemnation, yeah. shame, and it cleanses your body from the physical place that you gave the devil. So that's what First John 1, 9 is for. Yeah, and I would even say, adding to that on a practical term, when you realize that and you've done that with the Lord, if you've planted some negative things and you've spoken to your wife or your husband or your kids, or whatever in it wrong, you can go to them and say, hey, I was wrong. I mean, this is about the humility. Boy, humility just heals so much. You know, forgiveness and saying, hey, I'm sorry. Man, I've yelled at my kids and turned around and said, listen, I apologize. I should not have yelled at you like Amen. that. Mommy was tired or whatever. Or There's no excuse. I should now not see, have done that. The moment that. you start giving an excuse and say, <laughs> mommy know. was tired, you just ruined a good I know, apology. I know, now. but I've done that. I said, mommy's tired. But that's no excuse, so I apologize. Amen. And and you know what, man? It's just like, it just heals the atmosphere. I feel better. The enemy means not condemning me. And and it's a model for my children. You know, so God, even the negative things, once you do go down that path, man, God can restore it and heal so much. And I agree with that. In 90% of the cases, I think that that is a very godly thing to do. But there are times that you have taken an offense mm -hmm. and you have been condemned and nurturing this hatred and stuff. And the person that did it didn't even do it on purpose. No. They didn't mean it. Yeah, that's just don't go to them and tell them the rotten things. You know what you doing. did 10 years ago and yeah. Yeah, I've hated you ever since. They're like, what? now don't do, don't that, do that because <laughs> that is just going to make them now exposed to all of the hurt and the pain and the hatred. If, if you've done something and it's obvious and they know it and you know it, yes, yeah. you need to go leave your gift at the altar, go be reconciled That's to good. your brother or sister and stuff. But if it's something that you took an offense and you realize that, you know what, I just was touchy. Yeah. They, they didn't mean anything by this. Well, then you just deal with it and get your forgiveness and stuff, but don't go pollute them with your things Amen. that you've been feeling. That's excellent. So a question here, uh, Ruthie on chat says this, in Galatians 6, 2 says, bear you one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Can you explain how to not become spiritually or emotionally drained while bearing the burden? I know for me personally, when someone constantly complains or is being negative or grieving over things that have happened years ago, it's draining. Well, Ruthie, I, I could minister on that a long time and we got two minutes. <laughs> but let me say this, that there is a balance. Uh, people that are really compassionate tend to take on other people's problems. Oh yeah. And in a sense, that's good. You're bearing one another's burdens, but there are some people that they don't want their problem to be solved. What they want is just somebody to pity them. They want the mm -hmm. attention. You know, my personal assistant, when she first came to work for me, I think it's been in 2002, so it's been a long time ago. But she came in and she saw all of the letters and all of the things people asking, and I would throw a lot of them in the trash, and I wouldn't even dignify their request by dealing with it. And boy, Donna just, you, could I deal with this? I think I could help this person. And I said, Donna, this person, I've seen this. This person is a griper and a complainer, and what they want is an ear. They want, they'll occupy your time. Satan is going to wait. And she said, oh, I think I could deal with him. I said, go ahead. So for two or three months, she really tried to do all this stuff, and basically she realized that there's a lot of people that you aren't helping them. You're hurting them by giving them the attention, by indulging and saying, you know, Carrie, it, it really is bad, and I feel for you. Sometimes the best thing you can do is tell a person to, you know, just pull it together yeah. and yeah. get on with it. Grow up. So, Ruthie, there is a balance. You, there are some people that are genuinely wanting help that you can help them. Mm -hmm. There are other people that are genuinely wanting to abuse you, manipulate you through pity and stuff like that. And the only way I know to really define this is you just have to be led by the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit yeah. will show you. 
That's good. And there's some people that have come to me that the Lord told me this is, this person is toxic. And if you take on this problem that they have, it is going to hurt you. Yeah. Sometimes you have to tell a person, hey, you know what? I'm just not at the place to be able to handle all of your unbelief and hurt and pain. I'm going to go on with God. And when I get better, I'll come back and help you. Yeah. It's like yeah. a person stuck on the side of the road. You can pull off in the mud and get stuck with them and maybe they'll feel better. But now both of them. Now they're not lonely. <laughs> you know, sometimes you just need to wave at them and say, I'll go get help. I'll be back when I can. <laughs> That's good. We're out of time. We're out of time. But this is a good topic. What would you encourage if people were to call the helpline, um, how to deal with temptation, harnessing your emotions? Would there be something else that you could say, hey, this would be a great uh, material to listen to? Well, the thing that really makes me work is uh, what I call spirit, soul, and body, finding out your identity in Christ. Amen. Because every time your emotions are messed up, it's because you are looking at things only from your human perspective. You aren't dealing with it from God's ability. If you understood who you were in Christ and what God has done for you, it just makes you in a sense like Teflon. Everything yeah. else, nothing will stick. Amen. That's good. Well, I would recommend that. I just felt like there was also just something that the Lord is just saying, I don't know who this is for, but there's something specifically out there. You have been dealing with some situations and you're just meditating on it and meditating. Yep. You keep thinking about it and thinking about it. And well, if I said this or if they do this and you keep, you're, you're trying to do this little game of trying to figure out what to do and how to do it and when to do it and what to say. And you're meditating on it so much that it's hijacking your emotions. Amen. And so you just need to take your mind, give it to the Lord, surrender it to the Lord. The Lord will give you a spirit of wisdom and discernment. You'll know what to say, when to say it, because you're focused on Him. If you get my teaching on harnessing your emotions, this is one of the points that I make in there, that your emotions follow your thoughts. Amen. If you are depressed, it's because you are thinking on depressing things. And there are plenty of depressing things. Yeah, there are. If you are hurt and if you're dealing with unforgiveness, it's because you are thinking about what hurt you and you are thinking about all of these things. Yeah. The antidote, you can't eventually yeah. or ultimately harness your emotions without harnessing your thoughts and focusing on the godly things. So no. anyway, we could talk about this a lot longer. Amen. But it's well, been good. Well, join us again. Call our prayer line, 719-635-1111. Join us next Tuesday. And again, if you want the Bible study notes and you want to go over these things again, uh, awm.net slash Bible study so we can send those notes to you. So God bless you. Thank you for being with us. We'll see you next Tuesday. Join us next Tuesday for our live Bible study. To receive notes and to win giveaways, visit our website, 